guys, so today I'm going to be talking about the Qing Dynasty uh, and it's going to be divided into two parts. The first part is going to be more of a breakdown of the, you know, how it began and uh, I, we spent some time talking about that already so it's going to be really quick. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Opium War really quickly and just kind of give you a recap of everything we talked about last, um, last quarter and then we're going to move on to the more the more important parts and the newer parts which include the Taiping Rebellion which I will be skipping across briefly and also the whole issue of the self-strengthening movement and the three phases within it. So without further ado we're gonna go forward and um, the main focus this time is on the self-strengthening movement because um, it's, it's, uh, well, it's, all, it's what you guys are working on right now for your assignment but also for um, it's all, it's uh, what you're working on for your assignment, and also um, it's uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be on your exam essentially. So um, let's move on. So the Qing Dynasty began in 1644 and it ended in 1911. Uh, and it, the dynasty that came before that was the Ming Dynasty. The Manchurians came in, uh, re were resisted by the Chinese, but the Chinese general decided to surrender. Uh, there are a bunch of explanations. You don't need to know them. Uh, the new and started the new Manchurian dynasty, where um, the Manchu general, the Manchurians who came to China, decides to stay in Beijing and never leaves. Uh, he then declares himself emperor, and the Qing dynasty is established in 1664, um, and it's also known as the Manchurian dynasty. The Qing dynasty was also a dynasty which um, emphasized being Manchurian. Uh, Manchurian, and there was also there was a very clear distinction between if you're a Manchurian or if you're a Han Chinese. There is the issue of racial purity. If you are pure Manchurian, you were seen as superior, and um, a, a manifestation of that would be them reserving the Manchuri Manchuria, which is the Manchu homeland for Manchurians only. Meaning that Manchurians can go to China, but Chinese cannot go to Manchuria unless they're Manchurian. Um, and there's no intermarriage, so there's no way for them to become Manchurian. And there's also the whole issue of the Ch Chinese man being forced to wear the Manchurian hairstyle, uh, which is the cue which you see in uh, Chinese Kung Fu movies uh, from the Qing Dynasty. Well, not from the Qing Dynasty, but about the Qing Dynasty. So, in the Qing Dynasty, um, it wasn't just a purely Manchurian thing, though, because otherwise it'd be doing what the Mongolians did in the Yuan Dynasty, where the Mongolians came in, and essentially, um, you know, uh, pressed down upon, uh, pressed down upon the the Chinese, and and went total anti-Chinese, and that didn't last for over a hundred years. So, and the Mongolians were quickly kicked out after within a hundred years, you know, leading to the Ming Dynasty. So, the Qing was a, a lot smarter than that. Uh, they saw what the uh, the Mongolians did, and they decided to adopt Confucian governance. Um, promote Confucian scholarship which included the civil service examinations which we talked about earlier and also building a national library of history and philosophy where um, people uh, um, where, where they had a lot of resources to uh, or with history and philosophy and also creating an encyclopedia of Confucian thought and Chinese history so the Qing really did put an emphasis on um, Chineseness uh, and essential Confucian uh, parts. You, you'll notice that they kept a lot of the Confucian structure for govern for the governance, but not really um, give a parity for um, racial equality, which is uh, you know they did assert their Manchurianness. But over time, um, beginning in the sixteen in the sixteen hundreds, this was really of course quite severe. But over time, it, it really loosened up. Um, it really loosened up considerably compared to the past. Uh, and so we move on to the British East India Company, which uh, which was about the tea and opium. We know about the triangular the, the triangle trade, uh, where the British uh, uh, sent their goods to India. India is where they get the uh, their opium from, traded to China uh, for tea, and chi and China gives the uh, sends the and and then China uh, gets opium um, for the tea, and so. Um, it, there was a whole Canton trade system where they had the Hong merchants, the Kohong, um, and uh, 
and there's the whole tr deal with that, and we talked about that in the past, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. And it's this whole idea is based on mercantilism. You should have studied mercantilism back in grade 10, uh, which is a trade theory that focused on earning gold or silver, and one must export more than import. Uh, but it's about establishing markets, uh, establishing um, kind of a monopoly. And so there in uh, in uh, Britain, there is a demand for tea. Uh, trade and the trade of China is imbalanced. The tea the tea trade is a net drain in silver. Uh, and essentially, um, they got opium from Afghanistan and then the part of British India, and also you know India um, sold to China to prevent the outflow of silver from Britain. So basically, trading tea for opium, and we know we know that in the past, uh, opium is not new in China, and and it and it works. Um, the trade goes through, and uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. You can read this if, by yourself. And so China then suffers a drug problem because opium is plentiful and cheap, uh, creating problems with the, uh, creating a lot of problems, which leads to the Chinese appealing to the, to the British. Uh, you saw you, read, you saw in the movie uh, the Opium War. Ling Zhishu uh, writes a letter to, uh, to the Queen. Uh, it's questionable whether the Queen ever read the, that uh, letter, but uh, regardless, the British government does not reply. And uh, China searches the old British ships, throws the opium cargo into the ocean. Britain declares war, uh, and of course. They hand China their their uh, first uh, their first defeat to the West, leading to the tre the Treaty of Nanking of 1842, which is the first of a series of unequal treaties. And the Treaty of Nanking emphasized a couple of things: extraterritoriality, which uh, the British got gets special legal status, um, and they, and if you're British in uh, China, you only answer to British law. Uh, so if you uh, whatever crime you commit in China, you don't, uh, you won't get your head cut off. You will have to answer to the British law. Um, and they also there was also the infamous most favored nation clause, which is a Me Too clause, which is basically the British had a clause in their in the Treaty of Nanking saying that if China grants um, some benefits to any other countries, those whatever they grant to those other countries will automatically be transferred to the British as well. And so this is also known as the Me Too clause. Um, so, so for example, if China decides to grant trade to uh, the French, that that uh, deal will also apply to the British. And it's this is called the Most Favored Nation clause. Uh, the Treaty of Nanking also opened five ports, open trade, and the tariffs were created, controlled by the treaty and not China. And we looked at the Treaty of Nanking in more detail before. Uh, it was an unequal treaty, British citizens free to travel, they are free to preach too, and Protestant Christianity enters into China. And of course, um, the Protestants in China was an interesting thing, it, because, um, you know, uh, there's a, um, when people, uh, when they were in China, they, they, with the opening of China and the ports, uh, a lot of churches back, uh, in America were were um or or not even America uh, sorry Brit Britain, and also America and also the general West were happy because you know in China not only is it a huge market for trade, but it, there's also a lot of people to spread the gospel to, and so with that uh, they could um, send a lot of uh, missionaries over, and missions and therefore the missionary work came hand in hand with the treaty. Uh, opening in China, and it's uh, and but for the local Chinese, it was a very it was interesting because they perceived missionary work, uh, was as a connection to British military might. So it's it, oftentimes um, there's a there was this political cartoon I can't find it right now, but it's basically you have a cannon and a missionary standing right next missionary holding a Bible right next to it, and it was and it reflected a perception of the Chinese towards the West. And so they, a lot of Chinese saw uh, Protestantism uh, or just pretty, pretty much the gospel in China as being forced onto China along with British military might. And a question would it would be for you is would such a religion be or such a mission be appealing to you if you were an ethnic Chinese? Obviously, it was a huge turnoff. Uh, there was the Nev Nevius method where. Um, People tried to spread, uh, you know, mission work through service by building hospitals, schools, 
um, orphanages, etc. They focus on the women and the poor, and they built independent churches with native pastors and local seminaries. So uh, there were other ways to spread the gospel in China, not just sending missionaries and preaching, blah, blah, blah. They would actually put services in there. How uh, and it in the Protestant Catholic missions increased dramatically as a result of the Treaty of Nanking, leading to a, uh, a lot of contributions, which include uh, a lot of schools for commoners and particularly for girls, uh, because at that time girls would not be educated. Um, they were they translated a lot of major works, starting with the Bible into vernacular Chinese. So that's when uh, when the Bible you know was translated in Chinese and the gospel became a lot more accessible to everyone. Uh, it, but with these schools and with all, all the missions in China, it also brought in a lot of technology and science and it also brought in the Western concept of democratic governance. And it's really interesting because later on you will, you'll, you will find that it's, this, it's these concepts of, um, it, it's these concepts of uh, democratic governance where the Chinese actually travel to America, to Britain to learn about their methods, and and come back and it, it, it are the it's these Chinese that actually lead the change uh, and eventually the downfall of the Qing Dynasty. So um, there's there's been studies of um, um, it's well there have been studies of uh, the impact of missions in China and how and to what extent it led to the fall downfall of the Qing Dynasty. Uh, but you know it's this kind of this kind of research really is quite hard to grasp because there's really no way to go back in time and figure and find out the answer. Um, there have been studies and, and connections of Sun Yat-sen who is the seen as the, f the founder of modern China. Um, him and his, he's a, he was a Christian, or he was a doctor first, and then he was, he's also a Christian, but he also was able to get a lot of help from um, the overseas Chinese in San Francisco uh, for, to fund the, revolu the revolutionary movements in China. And so it's it's a lot of it's a lot of these connections where Protestantism really played a major role, but it, but it's also uh sorry a major role in changing China, but it's also a role which is very difficult to assess its its impact because it's simply so it's very intangible. So, um, the, with the Protestants in China, there's the issue of a uh, gunboat mission work again. Um, there's a perception of imperialism with, along with, uh, um, so even the net, even the, like, like I said before, there's the gunboat mission work, and there's a the Nevius method, right? Uh, the, the Nevius method was seen as, you know, it was very difficult for a Chinese to tell a difference between a gunboat mission and a Nevius method. It, there is a perceptions of imperialism overall, and they and they really can't go beyond. The average Chinese really can't tell the difference between, you know, they, they can't tell the difference between a French or a British, and they, and it's even harder to tell the difference between you know, a gunboat missionary or uh, a nephias missionary. It's it's very different, and uh, therefore there's the ideas of the foreign devils and their bizarre religions, and and overall anything Western was rejected. Uh, <laughs> there was issues of uh, missionaries uh, meeting uh, mi uh, missionaries meet, meet meet female infanticide and abandonment, and so these uh, missionaries would open these orphanages, and then uh, they will have these females go inside, and and they will all there's also these finders fees where they basically um, um, they get this funding to run these uh, orphanages. But from from the outside, it's very interesting because you had these missionaries uh, bringing in all these orphanages and these children, which go into this orphanage, and they never come out. And so there's a lot of these rumors and suspicions where a lot of Chinese who who are around these orphanages will look at them and they'll say like, uh, "Oh, okay, so there's a bunch of people entering these orphanages, but um, they never come out. These foreign devils must be eating them." Or they must be sacrificing them to the devil, or or, or, or something, something bizarre like that. And uh, there was, and this also led, to, and this also led to um, violence and a bunch of uh, and just general public uh, uh, dissatisfaction with the foreign presence in China. Over time, the, the Qing Dynasty began to stagnate in the eighteen hundreds. 
uh, which led to a dynastic decline. Uh, there was factionalism, which is, means uh, the government, were, there were a lot of different parties within the government that you know were always bickering and fighting over uh, with one another, and they really couldn't get things done. There was a lot of corruption, as seen in the opium, uh, and there was a lot of stagnation. Uh, there was not a lot of innovation. There was not a lot of... I mean, everything was very rigid because... Uh, Everyone needed to be very politically correct because the, there was the Confucian way, and that was the best way to do things. Um, there was disorder within the in, within the country with the different rebellions. There's a Taiping rebellion. There's a Nian rebellion. There's a Muslim rebellion. There's a whole bunch of rebellions happening in China during that time. And there was also the issue of the barbarian Manchu dynasty ruling over the Chinese, and the ratio of a Chinese to a Manchurian population would be like you know a hundred to one. And there was a general dissatisfaction with that as well. Uh, there was a Middle Kingdom syndrome where the Chinese didn't see they needed to change. Uh, they couldn't conceive any real threat, even though they lost the, even though they lost the Opium War. They still thought like, oh, that was an exception. Um, landed gentry had held all the real power, and the people who were the gentry, which are the gentry, is almost like an aristocratic class. They're always conservative, and they resist change because change would compromise their position. So if, if they were a rich, aristocratic, land-owning um, family, this family would not want any change because any change could jeopardize their position as a land-owning family. Uh, also, the Qing Dynasty was militarily and economically behind. They still, uh, militarily was obvious, they weren't modernized, they weren't industrialized, they couldn't, um, their cannons were old from the 16th century, while the other people were using cannons from the 19th century. And also, they were economically behind, which means uh, they had a, a, a very backward system. They weren't integrated into international trade. One of the more significant rebellions of that time was the Taiping Rebellion between 1850 to 1864. It was, it's known as the Taiping Tianguo, which uh, means literally the Heavenly Kingdom of Great Peace, led by this uh, person, Gahong Xiu Chuan, who was a charismatic leader, who was Christian-inspired, and he he was actually a, it was interesting because he was actually he was um, a Confucian scholar he was very talented and he went to many of these uh, um, examinations before and he failed all um, all three times the second the the first time he failed okay he, he he failed went home he was fourteen years old at that time the second time he tried uh, he was a little older and after he failed he was kind of distraught and he and he was handed a pamphlet a Christian pamphlet. On his way out, and then uh, he got that he got that uh, gospel tract, um, Christian pamphlet gospel tract, same thing. He has the gospel tract, you know, puts it in his room and uh, kind of skims over, puts it in the room, and just forgets about it. The third time he takes an exam, he fails miserably, goes home, enters depression, has uh, goes to sleep, has a dream about uh, about um, him about you know slaying foreign devils. Uh, him, uh, this foreigner, uh, this this person, and him, him being given a sword, and he be essentially uh, it uh, comes up with the idea that he is the younger brother of Jesus. He then goes into seminary training and so on, and then he he gets kicked kicked out of the sem seminary. Doesn't learn about the Trinity. Doesn't realize that oh, um, he technically can't be the younger brother of Jesus, uh, and Jesus is God, and 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 he creates this kind of this. Um, twisted version of um, Christianity, which is not really accepted by the West, and this becomes a, a problem because um, because you would think that if there's a a Taiping rebellion, a Christian rebellion in China, the West would be like, hurrah, we have a Christian uh, possibility of the Taiping rebellion overthrowing the Qing government, and we'll have a a Christian China, but. Uh, the truth is, the West saw the Taiping Rebellion. They sent in a couple of missionaries to check out their um, their doctrine and realize that hey, this is not a Christian rebellion. This is a cult. And so, from the perspective from the perspective of the West, uh, the Taiping Rebellion was a cult rebellion. Was not a uh, a proper Christian um, denomination or belief. And so they rejected the Taipings. There was also uh, and and so the Taipings, uh, you know. It's interesting because the Taipings are seen almost as a proto-communism. They had communal living. Um, uh, there was there was gender equality, and um, people were allowed to have divorce. Uh, they were allowed to have uh, they were allowed to be married. About allowed to be divorced. And uh, later on, uh, we'll be looking at some um, some of their doctrine, uh, and and you'll and you'll notice that 
there's there's parts which uh, emphasize um, which is essentially the Ten Commandments, but changed mixed in with uh, Confucianism and Taoism, along and along and so it's you create this strange fusion of a religion. Uh, there's uh, and so um, the type of rebellion also emphasized chastity and uh, yeah gender equality as I mentioned earlier. It was a massive movement. It was anti-foreign. It was anti-Manchu, and the Qing was unable to repress it. But Qing called not. They called upon the British for help, and the British helped put it down. And they also demanded reparations. So, uh, but it wasn't only the British that played a role in uh, putting down the uh, putting down the Taiping Rebellion. There was also the Chinese, which uh, the the Qing called for help. And note, I said Chinese, not the Manchurian. They actually asked the, asked the local Chinese leaders to help put it down. Um, because by that time, with the Opium War, uh, the Manchurian central government was already very weak. And so they decided to ask the local leaders of, um, of China to help. And that's when you have local leaders such as Zhang Guofan, uh, Li Hongzhang, and Zhuo Zongtang. And these people um, start building, uh, building their, modernizing their armies and at fighting the Taipings, and uh, they essentially were um, critical to the success of them. And you may ask the question, how come these Chinese leaders would help fight against the Taiping rather than fight, uh, uh, instead of helping the Taipings fight against the Manchurian? Because the Taiping rebellion was an uh, anti-Manchurian and anti-foreign rebellion. And uh, and the, the main idea behind that was that, uh, and later on you We'll, we'll go over this letter where you see Zhang Guofan saying that the reason why he, they don't want to fight the Manchurians is because the Manchurian dynasty was a Confucian dynasty, but the Taiping Rebellion was a Christian or, or a, a cult, a cult, a cultish Christian rebellion, and therefore, if they helped the Taipings, it would essentially wipe out everything they believe in, everything of the Chineseness that they believe in, and therefore, the, uh, the, the local Chinese leadership decided to help the Manchurians to put down the Taiping Rebellion. So regardless, the Taiping Rebellion was very successful. They took over half of China uh, from Nanjing down, uh, and from pretty much along the, Yang along the Yangtze River and south of the Yangtze River, pretty much became all... Um, more or less Taiping, uh, Taiping territory. And this lasted for 14 years um, before the Taiping collapsed with internal um, corruption um, and also uh, the help from the, from the foreigners the, from the West and also the help uh, from the local Chinese leaders. They all, them all put together, uh, put down a Taiping rebellion. By the 1860s, there was a question, should the Chinese retrench or reform? Some reform efforts uh, people recognized um, as the, the need to modernize, the, the need to improve technology, and the need to reform and re revitalize the government. However, these reform efforts were resisted by entrenched interests, such as the imperial court, which resisted change. The imperial court at that time was led, uh, uh, was generally led by uh, the uh, Empress Dowager Qi Shi, um, who uh, who resisted change and who was pretty much an ortho or but was an orthodox uh, believed in the orthodoxy of the government. There was also the Confucian officials who resisted change because they did not want to have a new um, a modernized. Uh, they did not want to have a. Uh, uh, hold on a second. And so, uh, yeah, it was also resisted by entrenched interests where the imperial court uh, uh, and Confucian officials did not want to have any, um, uh, did not want any change because if you, um, for example, if you put an emphasis in education on studying technology instead of studying Confucianism, you have the issue of uh, Confucian officials being displaced by the new um, technologically focused people. Right, and then uh, there was also a gentry class, the who were the powerful families and clans who resisted change as well, and so there was the issue of should they retrench or should they reform.
which leads to the self-strengthening movement, um, which uh, was the F, which is the general, which is the general term used to describe the Chinese uh, effort to modernize uh, in the in the mid 1800s, uh, up until the 1900s, uh, until the fall of the Qing Dynasty, and the self-strengthening movement uh, was uh, really began uh, when it, with the Arrow War, um, and with the Arrow War, uh, it's also known as the Second Opium War. Where in uh, 18, 1856, um, Qing officials boarded the Arrow, a Chinese-owned ship that has been registered that had been registered in Hong Kong and was suspected of piracy and smuggling. Twelve Chinese subjects were arrested and imprisoned. With the and uh, British officials in Guangzhou demanded the release of the sailors, claiming because the ship had recently been British registered, it was protected under the Treaty of Nanjing. So here you have a ship, the Arrow, which is a Chinese-owned ship. Uh, registered in Hong Kong. Hong Kong was British territory and therefore it should be British and therefore should be protected under the Treaty of Nanjing. Only when this was known to be a weak argument did the British insist that the arrow had been flying a British ensign, uh, a British flag, and when the Qing soldiers had insulted the flag. China, the China insisted that it did, did not hang out the national flag at that time and negotiations broke down. In fact, the registration of the nationality of the era had already had a time limit, and hence it, she did not have the right to fly the king's colors at uh, the the British colors at the time. And her crew's arrest by the Qing authority was lawful in any case. So, uh, but overall, um, because of this argument and because of the fighting with the Qing, the Taiping Rebellion, the Qing government really was in no position to resist the West militarily, and so. Once again, they fought and they lost, and they had to sign the Treaty of Nan the Tianjin, which was restoring the functioning of gov of the government, managing uh, managing relations with the barbarians. Uh, sorry, these are the things that they wanted to address after the era war and the Treaty of Tianjin. And the Treaty of Tianjin was um, was another treaty uh, which further imposed more uh, compensations, uh, more more indemnities, and um, also got more benefits for the British, but not not significant. Uh, pretty much, almost like a follow up of the Treaty of Nanjing, um, and it. But after this, um, people have started realizing the Qing, the Qing started realizing that we need to restore the government. We need to manage relations with barbarians. We need to address the military shortcomings, and uh, we need to modernize um, economically. And that, those were the main focuses of the self strengthening movement. The key participants include uh, the, Tongzhi Emperor, the Tongzhi Emperor at that time, uh, the Emperor da Dowager Qixi, who uh, uh, basically uh, went, uh, lived on until 1908, very long time, and she was a key player of the imperial courts at that time and was a huge resistance to modernization. Uh, Prince Gong, uh, the Emperor's uncle, was also a huge part of the modernization efforts. Zheng Gofan and Li Hongzhang, there was also Zhuo Zhongtang, but which uh, we're not going to look at, at as much as these two. Um, and these and these people led, uh, Zheng Gofan and Li Hongzhang led the Yangtze region reforms. Li Hongzhang uh, pretty much uh, was a main player in uh, all international relations between China and the West at that time. And his uh, protege, uh, Yuan Shikai, eventually inherits his Beiyang army. Uh, and that but that's another story for another time. Um, there were the the key participants also included Western advisors, which uh, include military scientific, uh, which were uh, military scientific, and they were also missionaries. And uh, but first, let's talk about the Tongji Restoration. The Tongji Restoration was the idea of a dynasty restoration or Tongxing, which is the Han, Tang, and Song, which are seen uh, historically seen as the the most glorious dynasties of uh, Chinese of of China, and the goal was to restore the Confucian values and and practices of the government, and the methods were therefore very traditional because the whole idea was to restore Confucianism, uh, and this and therefore you could almost see Tongji, Tong, the Tongji restoration as an idea to retrench, but also adopt uh, foreign um, um, method um, foreign uh, technology. Uh, the methods were very traditional, which included uh, Confucian schools and examinations, government personnel uh, involvement, and support for the landlords in the Yangtze Valley, which um, which included Zhang Guofan and uh, Li Hongzhang. Uh, problems were uh, uh, what, of the Tongji Restoration was that it it relied on the implementation 
uh, sorry, the implementation relied on the regional officials, and there was also no recognition of Western challenges. Uh, of um, so it was very inner focus. It was focused inside, looking inside, and saying we need to restore these things. And there was really wasn't much uh, uh, to address the um, the the West uh, challenging China. Uh, they also created the relations. Uh, they also created the Zhongli Yaman which was responsible to uh, handle relations with the foreign powers, which pretty much uh, centralized diplomacy and created a board of five officials. And, the, and, this was and these guys, they're pretty much uh, in charge of dealing with the, the, um, the, con the consuls in China and uh, speaking with the West. And they created a, a school for interpreters, which included the English and, uh, which included, um, English and the French. And uh, this, uh, in the students were mostly Manchurian youth. In 1867, they made a college, uh, and the curriculum included international law, astronomy, mathematics, chemistry, geology, and mechanics. And there was also the use of international law, where they took international law, which was, um, which there was an international law at that time where everyone more or less agreed upon, and they learned about it, and they started realizing, hey, we could use the 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 contents of this international law for our benefit. And uh, they also established legations uh, in uh, England and Germany in 1867, 1877, the U.S. and France in 78, and Russia and Spain in 79. And with the whole, um, the whole use of the international law, they also were able to get Russia to withdraw from, the, from Ely, which is a, a region in China, which they illegally occupied. And so China was able to take the, the contents of their international law and um, argue with Russia and say, hey, you guys are occupying this place illegally. And Russia was like, uh, okay. And basically, they really had no choice but to withdraw because they did occupy it illegally. But it was, uh, it was one of those minor victories which showed China that, hey, we can get involved. And, and, uh, and it made, them, and made the Chinese feel that, hey, uh, with this international law, we could, uh, fight, we could fend off the, the oppression of the West. But little did they, but there was a back uh, there was a uh, uh, downside to this in in that the Chinese actually believed that you know they started thinking that oh with international law we could fight we could argue through logic with the West and get them to back off but little did they know that um, you know without strength without military power uh, to back up this uh, international law um, there really was uh, it really didn't give them much bite which um, which means that. Uh, Without military strength to back up their arguments for international law, the international law was kind of useless. So the challenges main uh, the challenges of the of the of the of China at that time were mainly in the periphery, though, uh, because um, specifically with the uh, Sino-French War of eighteen eighty four as kind of a distraction to the whole Tongji Restoration. The self-strengthening movement can be divided into three period, three periods. The first period was between 1861 to 1872, which stressed Western arms and machinery, scientific knowledge, and uh, technical education. And this was um, kind of the the main idea at that time. Um, and they established arsenals uh, for for the military for a modernized military. In Shanghai in 1865, called the Jiangnan Arsenal, and, and also one in Fuzhou in 1866, called the Fuzhou Shipyard. And factories and shipyards produced uh, 13 steamships by 1873, and they also had cannons, rifles, and so on. And there's also an arsenal schools for interpreters, which also included science instruction and Western translations. And so the the first self strengthening movement, the first period, was kind of a, a full integration of. Um, Western uh, technology and uh, and knowledge and and so forth. The second period uh, between 1872 to 1885 uh, was the founding of an industrial base, where um, where in order to have uh, a modernized country, you need to have um, modern infrastructure such as uh, railways, telegraph lines, electricity, and so on, and so. They built uh, tele telegraph lines from between Shanghai to Tianjin in 1881, uh, uh, railroads, 
in coal mines in, such as in Kaiping in uh, 1878. The first railroad uh, um, f by built by Jardin Matheson in 1876 uh, was from Shanghai to Wusong, and it was only 13 miles long. However, by, 18, uh, by 1894, in a matter of 18 years, they only built not 195 miles of track. So pretty much it was, um, yeah, they, they did try to implement an industrial base, but it was a very slow, pro uh, it was a very slow process. Um, the government merchant ventures, uh, China, merchant, uh, China formed their China Merchant Steamship Navigation Company, built by Li Hongzhang in 1872. And so they, uh, the government did try to also modernize their, uh, their um, steamship building as well. There were also educational initi initiatives such as the American Study uh, Venture, where you have Yong Wang and Zhang Fan uh, talking, and in your readings for your assignment, there's actually a part where Yong Wang gives advice to uh, the Taipings. Uh, but Yong Wing was actually a, a Western educated person uh, who, uh, I think he went to Yale. Um, and uh, he came back to China. He met with the Taipings and gave the Taipings uh, ten, uh, 10 different advice to modernize. And of course, the Taipings, the Taipings ignored him. So, whatever. He then also met up with Zhang Guofan, gave him advice on, um, in your according to your readings, he, he basically gave him advice saying that uh, you need to uh, build uh, a factory to help make factories and um, instead of building a factory to um, um, build specific parts and so there was a there was a, a lack of understanding on the part of the Chinese on how to modernize but they, were, they also sent people abroad and consulted people abroad on how on different ways to uh, modernize their uh, industrial base um, and one of the things was uh, you know, sending 120 Chinese boys aged 12 to 14 to Hartford to study in U.S. prep schools, uh, and there's uh, there's um, you know, educational wise, they they didn't do so well. Uh, well, they did okay, but uh, what the boys, the Hartford boys, were known for actually yeah, abroad was uh, their baseball playing. Um, they formed a baseball team, and they actually were the best baseball team uh, of of that region at that time. And it's very interesting. You see a bunch of um, Chinese boys. In in the in eight in the eighteen hundreds in late eighteen hundreds in the U S with their, with still their uh, they still had their cues on playing baseball, and but this whole initiative ended in eighteen eighty one. Thirty students were also sent to Europe. The third period was uh, between eighteen eighty five to eighteen ninety five was uh, the diversification of enterprises where they try where the Chinese started to implement different um, different. Uh, Industries um, uh, will start to build their different industries, such as in cotton uh, for t um, making textiles, uh, paper, uh, making matches, and, ma and and iron forges to build their equipments. They started to build communications, such as the beginning of a national telegraph network and a serious railroad building. So, uh, f so the second period uh, they had some railroad building, but the, and by uh, the third period. They really emphasized and sped up the railroad building. There was also a military modernization where um, they ha uh, had ar arsenals in Tianjin uh, and military academies, especially in the north, to start training their armies. And this is uh, and Li Hongzhang played a major part in this because he was one who built the Beiyang Army, which was the most modern army, uh, modern navy of China at that time. So, in an evaluation of self-strengthening movement, um, overall, the Chinese um, had an idea where there was the issue of um, uh, of uh, of philosophy and application. Uh, if you read your um, oh, not if you read, you should have read the Yan Fu and uh, Feng Gui Fun readings. Uh, for modernization, you'll notice that um, you, these two people have very different opinions. Uh, one one of them suggested, and uh, I'm not going to say the name because you were supposed to have read it yourself. Um, one of them suggested that um, in order to have uh, China modernize, you 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 must throw away all things Chinese. Now you can't just okay. How, how should I say this? One of them said that. You can keep your Chinese philosophy, keep your Chinese thinking, and only take the Western technology and apply like that. 
<laughs> the other person argued that that's not possible because uh, you it's it's almost like um, it, because uh, the Chinese philosophy and the technology are are not in line with one another and, and it doesn't work like that in order for you to modernize you must also adopt the Western thinking and also in order to fully utilize the um, Western technology and so uh, and so uh, at that time there were these two schools of thought some saying that we need to throw away our Chineseness some say we can keep our Chineseness and only take the Western technology uh, and essentially, that's the whole issue. Uh, that's the that's the whole essence behind this uh, the this saying the statement, "Zhong uh, wei ti, xi xue wei yong," which is about um, Chinese studies for the essence and Western studies for utility for application. Uh, and the problems of this approach was evident educationally because um, educationally it doesn't work because if you were to study Chinese studies, uh, if you want to be a, if you want to be promoted in the Chinese government, you need to study the five classics. And the four books and five classics. Uh, uh, in Korean, that we call Saso Saso O Gyeong, right? The four books and five classics, Saso O Gyeong. And um, and um, in order, and you need to go take the civil service examinations and to graduate from that. And obviously, that's not going to work because if you study, if you spend time memorizing history, Chinese history, you're not going to have time to study mathematics and science. To develop um to to develop your technology. So if the smartest people at that time, and if you read the the Prince Gong memorials, um, which is part of your from the Tongwen College, which is which is also part of your assignment readings, you'll find that the Prince Gong memorials st actually um state explicitly that we we are having um the people that are in these uh, modernization schools are one old, two dumb. They're either the old people who couldn't be successful uh, in um, in uh, taking the civil service examination, or they're they're the dumb people that when can't memorize stuff, and their parents are rich and they and they want their children to have education, so they send them to a Western uh, a modernization school. And so educationally, it doesn't work. If you were a Chinese at that time, you were smart and you had potential, you would not study technology and math. You would go study history, which led to a, a real problem in uh, modernization. Uh, another thing is politically, it's incompatible. If you want to, um, politically, there's a, um, there's the whole issue of you want to climb, right? If you want to be a government official, like I said earlier, you needed to, uh, you needed to study the, the, the four books and five classics, not technology. And economically, it didn't work because a lot, uh, a lot of um, if you have a Chinese mentality uh, with trade, such as um, I don't know, like if you keep the not I don't know, uh, if you keep the tributary system, you're not gonna economically trade with the West because you cannot you cannot think you cannot have a Sinocentric mentality in trading before countries according to the West according to Western trade have to be equal in order to have trade and so the whole ideas between uh, the the whole Chinese studies for essence Western studies for utility does not work it did not work and in order for China to really fully modernize they really did need to embrace um, a more Western philosophy, maybe not embrace the whole thing, uh, and we can debate the extent of it, but um, you cannot keep everything Chinese. This, um, the final test for this really was with the Sino Japanese War, and if you guys have questions about the Sino Japanese War, you can ask uh, Michael Choi, and you can all look at him right now, and he's probably blushing and awkward uh, if he's here, um, and um, and smiling sheepishly right now, um, but if you uh, and since his um, extended essay is uh, on the Sino-Japanese War, um, this the the Sino-Japanese War was almost like a, a final test between these two nations. Um, China was modernizing with the Opium War after the Opium War. Japan began modernization, began their major restoration after the Opium War as well, um, and. Both of these countries uh, put their efforts in modernization for about 50 years, until which uh, went until the Sino-Japanese War, and at that time, because Japan was of some small island and everyone knew about China at that time, if people were gambling on uh, on uh, these two countries and who's going to win these uh, win this fight, most people put their money on China, saying, "Yeah, China will 
kick the Japanese butts. But um, obviously, it was exactly the other way around. This war was declared in uh, August the 1st, on August the 1st in 1894. Uh, the issue was the domination of Korea, which was a Chinese tributary state throughout the Ming and Qing dynasties. In 1876, it opened up to the rest of the world with Japan, uh, with the Japanese especially active um, with opening up Korea. And uh, the Chinese and Japanese backed different factions of the Yi court. And essentially, uh, it led to a breakdown in relations, and China and Japan had to fight over Korea. Uh, there were a couple of decisive battles. In 1894, the Chinese army was routed uh, near Pyongyang in October. A heavily armed Chinese fortress areas in uh, Port Arthur and Dadian was taken from the rear. But the Japanese took them over. Uh, in 1895, capture of Weihai Wei, also known as Shandong nowadays. Uh, from the rear, there's a native, there's a naval battle, battle off the Yalu River, where they had, where you had Chinese, uh, eleven Chinese warships versus uh, twelve Japanese modern warships, and the lack of fast ships, uh, and the Chinese lost because they had a lack of fast ships, because uh, Chi Shi was busy uh, putting um, her her naval, the naval funds for her new summer palace. If you go to uh, Beijing, if you ever been to Beijing, uh, you there's this summer palace, and in the summer palace you'll see a boat. A marble boat in the river. That marble boat was actually built during that time, and that marble boat, you know, it cost a lot of money. And if and if and because Chi Chi was putting that money in that marble boat instead of building and modernizing the army, there were disastrous battle tactics. Um, uh, such a, a um, here's a couple of examples. Uh, the Chinese decided to paint their boats three months before a war breaks out. Right, and so you know, paint is very flammable. And so when the Chinese and Japanese decided to start shooting at each other, one Japanese hit on China sends the Chinese boats ab ablaze because all the paint was new and it wasn't really, it wasn't completely dry yet. Uh, another example of a, uh, you know, just uh, the, of 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 a disaster of this war was was um the fact that a lot of the the uh, the, the gunpowder because there was a because if you want to. The, uh, you want to shoot cannons, you need gunpowder. And this gunpowder on these Chinese boats uh, were filled, well, half of them were filled with sand. And so you have people in the middle of a war and say, hey, we need more gunpowder. You know, you roll out a barrel, you open that barrel, uh, and then you unknowingly and uh, take that barrel, uh, take, take some of that stuff and pour it into your cannon, and then you light your cannon up, and boom. Um, wait. Nothing booms. It doesn't. It doesn't boom. Why? Because you put. You just put in a bunch of sand into your your cannon, and um, and people start realizing that. And not only does that mess up. Does not only does it not shoot. It also messes up the cannons. And so here you have a case where the Chinese in the middle of war fighting the Japanese, but they cannot. Um, they cannot do things right. And the guns are out of con out of commission. Uh, you have issues where um, the, some of the captains for these boats are uh, Western mercenaries hired. And so they're basically, these boats, uh, these Chinese boats are led by Western uh, com uh, commanders, uh, captains, and these captains are yelling at orders. The Chinese are like, uh, what the heck are you saying? We don't understand you. Uh, please speak Chinese. Um, and the, the Western people look back at them. They look at each other, very funny. And, and then meanwhile, they get shot by the Japanese. Uh, on the other hand, you have the Japanese boats where um, the Japanese... Uh, sent, uh, build military academies, and we'll be looking at Japanese modernization later on, but the Japanese basically have Japanese captains with Japanese crew, and uh, communication, there were no problems with communications, and, he's, and basically, the Chinese couldn't keep up with the Japanese, and the Chinese lost four ships, the Japanese lost one, uh, but, and that was only one of the very, um, that, was, that was only one of the ba major battles, but there were a bunch of other battles that resulted, have, had similar results. Uh, and which led to the Treaty of Shimonoseki, and I know you're all laughing right now uh, because you know you see the word seki um, grow up. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> uh, the the Treaty of Shimonoseki was uh, a tr was a, an unequal treaty, and you know Japan with its wholesale modernization not only um, not only modernized you know their education, not only modernized their technology. They even modern. They even learned the Western methods of imposing an unequal treaty upon China, and the Treaty of Shimonoseki was basically an unequal treaty. And this was the first case of an Asian country uh, imposing uh, uh, an unequal treaty upon another uh, Asian nation.
And so China gave up all their claims in Korea. And so if you start, if you uh, if you are ever wondering uh, when did Korea start becoming part of uh, um, the influence of Japan, well, pretty much a treaty of Shimonoseki did it, uh, where in 1895 uh, it was pretty much given up. Uh, they they China gave up Japan. Uh, China gave up Korea, and Japan pretty much had influence in Korea. Um, and that pretty and over time this became. Uh, pretty much a takeover uh, where Korea became a, ter uh, a part of the Japanese Empire. At that time still it was not part of the Japanese Empire but that was really the beginning. Uh, Japan got Taiwan and large indemnity and it was the beginning of Japan as a colonial power um, and uh, Japan was also to get Liaodong, the Liaodong Peninsula but uh, Russia, Germany and France intervened and this was called the Triple Intervention. We'll be, and, and uh, we, I think we looked at that before, but uh, we can revisit this in the future when we start looking at the, the Japanese history. The significance of the war. It set off, the scram it set off a scramble for concessions by Western powers. They start China's, uh, they, the West realized that, hey, Japan beat China. China really is super weak. And so the, the West was also like, uh, okay, we want stuff too. It, it also let... Uh, Great, provided great impetus for the Chinese revolutionary movement against the Qing. But Chinese are like, okay, that's it. The Manchurian dynasty is a total failure. We lost to the Japanese. Some, a bunch of pirates, you know, um, historically the Japanese were seen as pirates. A bunch of pirates off, off, um, off, off the coast of Korea. And we lost to them. And so this really gave the Chinese more of a reason to kick out the Qing. Uh, it led to the end of the self-strengthening movement because uh, many saw this as a test of parallel modernizing processes in China and Japan and everyone agreed pretty much agreed that China's process had failed uh, when it com when it is compared to Japan um, the Empress Dowager uh, this is just, uh, and sorry um, and the significant and the, the significance of this war is pretty much um, pretty much uh, yeah ends the self strengthening movement and is uh, kind of rounds off um, everything we need to talk about um, but just to get, just to have a brief look at the characters, uh, the Empress Dowager Shishi rules from 1861 to 1898. Uh, she's a royal concubine whose son became the emperor at the age of five. He, uh, she was the first wife and had no sons. Uh, and she ruled as regent over her son. A regent is a person who pretty much uh, an, if an emperor was to be an emperor. They uh, and they're too young. They needed someone to look over and make decisions for him until he's ready. And so she was a regent. Uh, she was a uh, conservative, uh, traditional, and backward-looking dictator. And so she resisted a lot of change. Um, the, the child emperor followed the path of debauchery. Uh, pretty much uh, was um, you know, a typical corrupt emperor at that time who was into alcohol and drugs such as opium, who had uh, prostitutes, both um, female and male. Um, and he was uh, because... Uh, because he was so dependent on uh, on the regents, was pretty much debilitated and useless. Um, and at nineteen, um, uh, he died of a combination of smallpox and a VD um, venereal disease, which is basically um, a sex disease. Uh, and Tishi generally believed that to have encouraged the, the debauchery to keep him from challenging her power. And so here you have the Empress Dowager giving her son uh, a bunch of prostitutes, uh, and a, a bunch of prostitutes, a bunch of drugs to keep him happy and basically not want any power. The Empress Dowager uh, was characterized as dictator dictatorial, vicious, reactionary, I mean, uh, slow to do things, and names a, new, new f a four year old nephew as a new emperor, continues as regents, but both of her co-regents die, so um, so there were three regents. She was one of them, and both of them die mysteriously. So obviously, uh, she was known to be uh, very vicious as well. Uh, here's that uh, marble boat I was talking about from the Summer Palace. You ever go to Beijing? You can see it, and uh, and she retires to the Summer Palace in eight, 1889. Her nephews tries to uh, start some reform. Uh, the new emperor. The nephew tries to start from reform, which includes some railroads and telegraphs. Uh, there was a hundred days reform. We'll look at that in more detail later on. Uh, 
uh, where government and economic reforms began. Uh, she, she's like, I don't like what's, what I see right now. And so she returns from retirement. Uh, she imprisons the emperor on an island in a lake inside the Forbidden City, stops all the reforms, and purges and, and kills all the reformers. And so this is, a, once again, a very vicious woman uh, who was totally against 100 Days Reform, which was an idea proposed by... Uh, proposed by some West um, some Chinese and but Western educated reformers and uh, she uh, from her bed deathbed she orders her emperor nephew who was stuck on an island poison he dies and she follows with a day China is left with another four-year-old emperor and uh, the movie the last emperor is pretty much uh, uh, tells the whole story of this little boy emperor's life and so back to the 1800s uh, in 19, 19, so once again, the whole modernization process ends with 1894-1895 Sino-Japanese War with trouble in Korea involving China and Japan's in the war where Japan wins easily, demands reparations, and regrets an unequal treaty. And uh, yes, this seems to be some other stuff. And uh, we'll look at this later on. Okay, that's it for today and see ya.